All right, Brian, so you see our players seated here. They're just about ready to roll. You said you're particularly excited about this matchup. Yeah. This is Piotr Gogoski on John Sacrifice. He's the only player in the field running the deck. Chris Kvartek is on his own build of Teamer Reclamation. Uh, what what entices you well, here? I think these are two of the most interesting decks in the entire field because Chris Kvartek is playing Teamer Reclamation, which is interestingly a deck that four players brought, but none of them work together. A lot of the sort of duplicate decks we see are uh, you know various teams of players who are playing identical lists. That's not true of any of the team reclamation lists, and Kvartek's version is the most unusual. As they're saying, uh, introing this match, he plays Nissa who shakes the world mm -hmm. in lieu of any kind of sweepers. And uh, that did not do very well for him in his matchup against Seth Manfield we saw on camera yesterday. But in this matchup, those Nissas can be amazingly powerful. And on the flip side, Canister's list, he, he is playing Jun Sacrifice, but he's playing Jun Sacrifice as the only uh, player in the field as opposed to at the, the Mythic Championship where he won. And it has some very interesting uh, inclusions like those agonizing, uh, agonizing remorses, which are excellent in this matchup in particular. A little bit of a rough start here for Canister. He's now on five cards. He's finally found a nice keeper here, but uh, yeah, not the way he wanted to start his day. Quick, a quick double mulligan for him. Yeah, we, we have seen Canister, uh, we did see Canister struggle a bit <laughs> with his land draws uh, in the limited portion where I think he drew like 15 land yeah, in one a game. A lot of lands. Outrageous number. And now, you know, mulling into five here is not how you want to start this day. But, uh, you know, it does have a lot of the, the key uh, elements of his deck, including that Agonizing Remorse in this matchup can be very powerful, but it's not clear when you on, are on a mulligan to so few cards. You can afford to, uh, to break up your own synergistic draws with just disruption for your opponent. That's right, and he does have the pieces here. He's got the Witches Oven, the Cauldron Familiar, and the Mayhem Devil, so he'll be able to enact some of his key synergies, but he is going to need more to go over the top. You look at Chris Kvartek's build here. You mentioned Nissa, who shakes the world. We could see her on the battlefield on turn four with this draw. Yep. And, uh, you know, that could be devastating for Canister, particularly if Kavarta gets to untap and cast that Hydrate Crisis. We've seen that sequence. Oh, and look at this, and Brian. Uro as well. Uro, too. So very early mana here for Chris Kavartek. And uh, with a relatively slow start for Canister, given his mulligan to five, he can just ignore this stuff, right? He's like, yeah, sure, do call him familiar things. Like, I'm not going to be at 10 live. One of the really interesting things about Chris Kvartek's deck uh, is that it doesn't necessarily operate entirely as a Reclamation deck. A lot of the Reclamation decks, they really need Reclamation to do anything because mm -hmm. they're these Expansion Explosion decks pretty much purely. Uh, his deck can just be mid-range Teamer. You know, we see that it, with this style of draw, he has Growth Spiral into uh, you know, additional Mana Ramp with Uro, into Nissa, into Krasis. It's just like incredibly explosive without the namesake card of the deck. Right, it has nothing to do with it. He can just sort of play that to get extra synergies going. Basically, just think of this deck as big mana. He just has multiple ways produ to produce early mana here, which we actually get to showcase right now with Growth Spiral and Uro. And then he can take advantage of Wilderness Reclamation as a major mana engine in the mid to late game as well. And here we see, you know, one of the more popular cards uh, in the tournament, Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. Triggers going on the stack all over the place from Canister's side, but Uro has two triggers. One of them's going to make Uro get sacrificed. The other one is going to gain three life, draw a card, and you can play an additional land. And there's an expansion explosion. That can be part of the big finish particularly in conjunction with Wilderness Reclamation. So, Chris Kvartek has his mana under him quite cleanly here, has two copies of Nissa Who Shakes the World at the ready, and that Hydroid Crisis is also good to go. Unfortunately for Canister, the Thrashing Brontodon not doing a whole lot at the moment, and he does draw Corvold. I mean, the Thrashing Brontodon here is just part of a clock, right? And, and mm -hmm. the fact that... Uh, the Mayhem Devil came down to go alongside the, the Cat Oven does mean that Canister's already down, rather, Canister's already gotten Kvartek down to mm. 11. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a lot of aggression that can come down. He's not really in a, in a position where, where uh, Kvartek can just play Nissa and assume it's going to live, or even just you know, pr protect his life total by uh, blocking with the, uh, or you know, not to worry about protecting his life total by blocking with the, uh, the, the forest or whatever land he animates. Right. Just a dangerous position that he's in, down to 11 life, with that Mayhem Devil plus the uh, the uh, Cat plus Oven already in play. So Kvartek's main game plan here revolves around Nissa, who shakes the world, who he now has on the battlefield. And his game plan from here is going to be keep her alive. <laughs> <laughs> and if Canister can somehow piece a way to actually get Nissa off the battlefield, that would be a big step. But it looks like he's recognized 
He just doesn't have that kind of flexibility and might just be going upstairs. And the, the really big issue here is just the fact that Canister is light on, on mana because of, ooh, Mayhem Devil. Okay, that becomes pretty interesting. The fact that he has the ability to bring back the cat and can sacrifice the cat, he can actually do four damage with Mayhem Devil. Interesting. And I don't know if you caught that, but uh, Canister was counting. He's like, hmm, what do I got here? He can actually take out the, the Castle Vantress and kill Vanessa with attacks. What are... Wow. Kvartek's life total is plummeting very can quickly can here. Just kill him? I wonder Hold if on. he can actually just kill it him. It goes in face, then, then sacrifices the food to bring back the cat. That's two more. That's actually That's lethal? just lethal damage. Did Kansas wow. just steal That's this just game damage. off a of mulligan to five? Look at wow. that. Wow, nice I was, job, I was looking Kyoder. at first, I was like, okay, can he just ping down this? It's like, wait, no, he can ping down and then and then just kill him. Wow. And, and what we, a victory. we saw there, I mean, we're talking about, okay, well, you know, what the position was for each of the players. Mm -hmm. That Mayhem Devil initially was already very scary. The second Mayhem Devil with Cat Oven just does so much damage. Wow. Three mana total there for Pyotr Kukowski. That's all he needed to get the job done. All right. Okay. Pyotr came to play. I get it. I mean, I, I, we're seeing now why uh, Piotr is undefeated with this deck, not only in this tournament so far, but including the previous tournament. <laughs> yeah, his life. <laughs> I, I think he went 8-0 and zero in matches uh, to win Mythic Championship 7, and now he is 2-0 and zero in this tournament, up a game here against Chris Kvartek. He is on an absolute tear with this deck in various versions, right? This right. is not the same deck in, in, in you know, precise terms that he played to win the Mythic Championship. It's not the same metagame, but he clearly understands the ins and outs uh, of what this deck is capable of. It's interesting, right? He's the only one that sleeved up this deck. It didn't really seem to be on the player's radars in a meaningful way, uh, you know, for, for the players, for the other players in the tournament. But Piotr has, at least thus far, found a way to make it work for himself, and we'll see if he can continue doing so. Kavartek had a turn for Nissa. It just wasn't enough. He just simply got ran over. This time, though, his draw looks a little different. This is much uh, less focused on Nissa. He's got two reactive spells with the Scorching Dragonfire and the Aether Gust at the ready. Oh, and an Uro off the top. And he does a Wilderness Reclamation, just which he did not have last game. You know, Wilderness yes. Reclamation last game would have been potentially very packed. Actually, no, he didn't have any instance to play with it. So no, but here really he does. Big a deal. But here, yes, he has the uh, the Aether Gust, the Dragonfire, and the Expansion Explosion already. So uh, the real key, of course, that Mayhem Devil just remaining in play. And and we talked about how the Nissa is very powerful against the mid range decks. But in that last game, he probably would have rather had Stormwrath because mm -hmm. he could have cleared off that Mayhem Devil and kept himself alive. Kavartex going to take another hit from the Cauldron Familiar, and he is going to face down a Duress. Kind of interesting because you want to try to find a window to nab that Cauldron Familiar when there's no food or witches oven at the ready, but uh, it can be tricky. Mm -hmm. Scorching Dragon Fire is a way to get rid of it. It exiles. Kavartek did have a window at the end of the last turn to do so, but chose against it, perhaps hoping to get something better like a Mayhem Devil or something like that. I guess the most likely thing he's considering is Expansion Explosion, simply because it can just give uh, you know, a, a burst of additional resources. The others are simply removal effects or things that will slow him down. Yeah, they're... Expansion Explosion goes away. Yeah. Crucially, with the Wilderness Reclamation in play, that's effectively doubling your, your, your mana for your lands, so that could be an explosion for, uh, for four just next turn, even if there isn't a land drawn. Kvartek feels like he needs to do something here, so he's going to Aether Gust a Trail of Crumbs. And that's going to get put back on top of the library here for Canister. Back over to Kvartek. His most obvious play is Uro, and he's just going to run that out. Finds another expansion explosion right off the top of the library there, so uh, he's able to get his resources back under him. But unfortunately for Chris, no land drop for this turn. Wilderness Reclamation trigger on the stack. Now Glagowski's going to go ahead and sacrifice the cat. That gives him that food sitting in play. 
now he's going to run out trail of crumbs, and this time it's going to stick. And now he's going to bring back the cauldron familiar and start getting triggers. We also noticed that uh, Canister waited until his oven untapped to bring back the cat. So he, That's right. so he doesn't care as much about getting the attack in, which he would get if he returned at the end of turn. But he knows there's Scorching Dragonfire that could exile it uh, in Kavartek's hand. So he mm -hmm. wants to wait until he has the oven untapped to protect it from that exile effect. And it has become very important. That Cauldron Familiar kind of is one of the linchpins here because we've seen this before, right? If you've watched this deck go off, uh, you, you'll be familiar with the sequence here with the Witches of and the Cauldron Familiar and the Trail of Crumbs generating really huge advantage. And uh, if I'm in Kavartek's seat, I'm starting to get a little hot under the collar here. Uh, he doesn't really have a whole lot going on on his side. And now he's got the, the Uro. So that that is the kind of thing that he needs to do to, to you know keep his game plan moving forward. There is a Noxious Grasp in hand for Canisters who will be able to take out this Uro, but that's that's his turn, right? Mm -hmm. And he wants to be able to use his mana to pay for Trail of Crumbs when he's you know getting the uh, using the food tokens. Uh, so he, to generate resources himself, because he's kind of, again, stuck on land. He's got those two Mayhem Devils, which he'd love to be able to actually deploy and get value out of this. Yeah, boy, I'm, I, if I'm in Vartex seat, I'm looking and I'm wondering if maybe I should have taken out that familiar while I had that one, there was one window where he yes. could have done so. Again, he may be, you know, thinking of Scorching Dragonfire for a different target, I'm not sure. Oh, we did see just how powerful the Mayhem Devil was last game, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, if the uh, the Cauldron Familiar were not part of that equation either, there's still you know just the possibility that uh, he's able to be clear if there's if there's no cat. So. I'm curious how Canister chooses to play this. If he's going to play Noxus Grasp. He's going to play Agonizing Remorse. He does know that there's Dragonfire in hand. Yes. So Agonizing Remorse, he's like, okay, well, what could you have drawn to this point that's really that scary that I need to hit with my discard uh, effect that is perhaps scarier than you getting to attack and just draw extra cards with Uro decides, all right, well, getting rid of the Uro that I know was a problem is a bigger deal. So Noxious Grass is going to hit Uro, but as we know, Uro doesn't always stay in the graveyard Ooh, for too long. Dear. Hello, that this is, who is the world. Wow, Nissa, who shakes the world in conjunction with Wilderness Reclamation, is going to give Chris Kvartek a lot of mana oh, yeah. at the ready here. And oh, we could see something like an explosion into a Hydroid Crisis. There's a lot of options for him from this juncture. And at a cool 19 life, he's got to feel very good about drawing that Nissa. Yeah, now, I mean, this is going to be able to float three and then has how many actual forests? He has three forests. So he's going to have three floated. Uh, four the, floated, that, right? The, oh, four. You're totally right. That, yeah. that, that was one of the forces untapped. Mm -hmm. So four, yeah. Uh, so 10, 11, 12, 13 mana? If I'm I, think I, I think he can find something to do with There's 13 a lot. mana. There's a lot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to be fair, it is during his end step with the, well, because of the Wilderness Reclamation. Right, but so that's, expansion that's explosion explosion. For, It's explosion for nine. That sounds just fine. And also relatively in, insurmountable if you're sitting in a canister seat if your opponent just reloads on this level. Yeah, he needs one more red in there, yeah. <laughs> Boom. And, you know, this uh, alongside Reclamation, you just get so much this of your mana magnified disgusting. in an incredibly powerful way. Ugh. And there we go, Ooh. explosion for nine. You go down to 14, and look at all those cards go into hand for Kavartek. The other thing to keep in mind here as well is that while he will have to discard a few of these cards, I think four of them, that's just food for Uro down the right. line as well. I mean, it just all comes together once he kind of gets over the hump. You know, in game one, we were talking about keeping Nissa on the battlefield and resolving Hydroid Crisis. In this case, it was Nissa on the battlefield in this case with Wilderness Reclamation, but just resolving the big spell. In this case, it was Explosion. And that just puts Chris Kavartek at such a resource advantage. It's, yeah. it's a little obscene. I mean, look at that. I mean, this is this is sort of, you know, when you when you think of the magical Christmas land combos, mm -hmm. I'm like, ooh, what can I do if I have all of these cards? He's got all those cards, <laughs> right? And, <laughs> he and does. He, he does. He's got another Wilderness Reclamation in his hand. He's got another Expansion Explosion in his hand. If he really just wants to kind of like, you know, I think he probably... Just looking at it, I think with Wilderness Reclamation uh, number two plus Expansion Explosion, he can just kill Canister next turn. Crazy. 
Like, this isn't even like he's setting up to generate additional advantages. Those two cards in combination, uh, I believe, are just lethal damage next turn. That's absurd. It's it's insane. The, the, the way that these two decks play out sort of fundamentally is really interesting because Canister's deck, for the most part, is about small incremental advantage. Drain you for one. Look at our top cards, right? Just sort of chip away, ping damage here, a little bit of damage there, and it all kind of adds up to this powerful, robust, and fairly consistent shell. On the other side, it's all focused on these huge haymakers, where you're just like, I draw eight, you take a bunch of damage, and all of a sudden the game's over. And Agonizing Remorse does allow Canister to make the game not just over here. Okay. Because he's he uh, does get the, uh, <laughs> the explosion out of the hand, but uh -oh. there's still a lot that can go on here. So Canister is such a ham. You see what he's doing with the targeting? <laughs> yeah, he's funny. He's really one of the most popular streamers, and I know why. He's just really funny. And here he recognizes, I can't kill Nyssa. You know, I can't mm -hmm. do enough damage to kill Nyssa, but I need to do something to stem the bleeding of this combination here, and he's going to go ahead and use uh, the triggers from the Mayhem okay. Devil to take out this Stomping Ground, which does uh, effectively cut off a significant amount of mana for Kvartek next year. Right. So but is now, it enough? Yeah, so now the question is, is Kvartek back on the, okay, I'm just going to make a huge crisis plan since he does have Nissa on the battlefield. Is that is that the game plan? It, it's possible. He also just, you know, he has the Scorching Dragonfire. He can get rid of this Mayhem Devil if he wants, mm -hmm. which I think is, is pretty likely. Uh, he can even get rid of the Cauldron Familiar. There's the, the Witch's Oven is tapped. Yeah, yeah. there's was, no food around, and that's that cat <laughs> did so much work. It will not come one. back the very next day. Yeah. We get a little oops there out of canister. Uh, you do see, uh, you know, Kvartek has a peculiar build as well of the Team Erect deck. He's kind of doing all of it, right? Mm -hmm. And you see some of the ways that it doesn't actually synergize. Like, the he could have access to two Wilderness Reclamations plus Nissa here, but all he could really do is cast an Aether Gust off of it from this point because he's put the Hydrate Crisis in the deck, right? Mm -hmm. So he's, he's kind of splitting things a little bit here and there, but it does look like it'll work out for him here anyway. And there is the ability to just play a Hydra Crisis, then get your, you know, your untap effect with Wilderness Reclamation with your whole new hand of cards. That's true. That, that's a good point. No, that is true. That is a huge benefit. It, get, it allows him to be reactive while also building out his board. And, and worst case scenario, one of those cards is Aether Gust, and you know you can cast it and, mm -hmm. and put the, uh, the Mayhem Devil back on top. So here's a Crisis six for cards. six. He found pretty, a Growth Spiral. Pretty mediocre. He yeah. didn't get a Growth Spiral, which let, lets him do something, but mm -hmm. he didn't find another removal effect. He didn't find... You know, another expansion explosion. I believe he's down to just one left in his deck. We've seen three of them. Two were discarded with Agonizing Remorse, and one was actually cast. Canister facing all types of trouble here, but he is up a game. Of course, he's got to he's got to troll Kavartek a little bit. I mean, that's that's his his mo. Yeah. His idea of fun may may be misaligned with the other players, but. <laughs> 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 yes, that is a good way to put that, and I remember him saying that as oh, well. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I love those player pieces. They're they're so good. They were really fun. I, I also love the the little player avatars here. They're mm -hmm. fantastic. What I really want. You want one of those, don't you? Yes. <laughs> but what I also want is for there to be vocal emotes of each of the things from the player. Oh, that's good. That would really be that would really be something. Anyway, eighth or wait, what do you think Kavartek would say? Drink more water? Or? <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> that, would, that would be crazy. Oh, boy. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so nine power in play, but another three coming here off of Nyssa. And uh, things, again, looking completely dire here <clears throat> if you're sitting in, uh, in Piotr's seat. But I mentioned it just a minute ago. We're not done yet. Kvartek's going to win this We're done game. yet. <laughs> yeah, but we're not doing with the matches, but I yeah, it's yeah. true. It's true. Yeah, a mulligan to five uh, in game number one for Glagoski did not slow him down. He was able to put together an aggressive game and finish off Chris Kvartek in the first game. That one did not go so well. Kvartek finally got to untap and go over the top with his really obscene amounts of mana. I mean, this deck can produce so much mana in the mid game and uh, he was able to leverage it into a, a full hand and uh, finish off the game. We're going to get a game 3. Now, I will remind you that we were going to see being excuse me, we're going to be seeing a lot of eliminations today. Yes. Not this match. Mm -hmm. This is this is one match that you do have to give here early in the day, but still a loss puts you one step away from being out of the tournament entirely. Another mulligan now for Canister. 
Oof. That's a good one, though. This is a good opener. Get an oven in that thing, and he is rocking and rolling. Yeah, does have himself the uh, familiar trail of Chrome's Mayhem Devil. Three pretty key cards. A solid draw for uh, Kvartek here with the ramp into Nyssa. The big thing that Kvartek doesn't want is to just be... Uh, Put, have too much pressure put on him right now because yes. his draw is powerful, but this is the kind of draw he had in game one, yes. right? Which is Ramp the Nissa. And if your opponent doesn't do much to pressure you, that's fantastic. If your opponent does a lot to pressure you, it's not. Big issue, though, he's got a bunch of tap. Temple, temple, temple. He's already got two temples on the battlefield as well. It still ramps him into Nissa on time. One of the weird yes. things, he has Nissa into no forests. I actually just weird. thought about that. Yes. He actually currently has zero forest, so Nissa generates zero additional mana. Wow, and if he doesn't draw an untapped blue source off of a growth spiral here, then he won't be able to play Omen of the Sea, although he actually did. Now the question is, does he risk it? Well, he it's also put Breeding Pool in, put Mountain in, play Omen. Yeah. He's not going to risk no, it. No, I, th I think that he just wants to get the additional scries here too, get, get those, yep. those tapped lands out of the way. Makes sense. I wouldn't have risked it either. But you do feel the pressure here, right? right. Uh, you know, he's facing down four power, but we know that this combination of cards can really get out of hand quickly. Gilded Goose off the top, but still no sacrifice outlet yet for Canister. That's really the only saving grace for Kavartek, who has fallen significantly well, behind. There is the Gilded Goose to sacrifice at least the food and generate food, mm -hmm. and he can just start naturally sacrificing food to the... Uh, the uh, natural food ability to, to get cards of Trail of Crumbs and find himself those permanents that can give him the advantage. This is getting really out of hand really quickly. This draw from Canister very quick. As you can see, he's emptied out every card in his hand. Where Kavartek still has five cards in hand, yeah. he just has not been able to deploy them in an in a efficient manner. Ooh, oh. Murderous Rider. That's the only one yeah. he has in his main deck, and it looks like none in the sideboard. That is such a big draw wow. here. That, that, <laughs> Nista, that Nista is Kvartek's entire game plan. Yes. That's all he's got, right? The rest of his hand is Omen of the Sea, Gross Spiral, Land. That Murderous Rider is absolutely just going to, to chop out his hopes from under him here. Yeah, now, now can he use Murderous Rider to kill the Breeding Pool and kill Nissa? Not quite, right? I believe he can. Well, either way, he can get rid of the Breeding Pool via triggers from the uh, Mayhem yeah. Devil or just use a Murderous Rider. But, mm -hmm. wow. What a draw. There are, there's one Murderous Rider in his 75 cards. <laughs> yeah. And he just drew it the turn that Nissa came down. And it looks like he's going to be able to find a way to get rid of Nissa regardless. But, wow. This is huge. I mean, that was probably the game. Yeah, that was... Like, I assume... So, the Breeding Pool dies... Murderous Rider kills Nissa. The creatures get to go at Kavartek. Like, Kavartek's going to have one turn. Mm -hmm. Growth Spiral in response. Can it find something? Wilderness Reclamation. Boy, these temples were brutal. Yeah. If you look at his mana base, it is five temples right now. They're all in play. Every single one of them. I mean, the, the, the weird thing is, other than you know, Growth Spiral a little bit earlier, it, didn't, it wouldn't have changed too much. Right, because he actually still got the Nissa into play. No, it didn't change that much. But this, did you see that look from yeah. Kvartek? He's Ooh. like, that's what I needed you not to have. Right. And that on was five. probably game, a bad yeah. draw. Oh, and he even and he, he, had, he had the expansion. Well, he, had, he put it on top because oh. he had this in play. Oh. He, had, he had Wilderness Reclamation. He had the Nissa in play. And now it backfires on him pretty badly. Now, can he survive the turn is the question. He, he can, can play Wilderness explosion. Red. And an explosion, the Mayhem Devil. Yeah. Will that allow him to survive? He doesn't die on board. Does he have a land drop to make here? He already played a land. Okay, so he has to float. Ooh, this is going to be very, very close, but it looks good for Pyotr Glagowski. Wow, that murderous rider. The swift end was devastating there to Chris Kavartak's entire game plan. The way that his draw came together was all in on Nyssa, and now he's in a very precarious position. So he's going to be able to kill Mayhem Devil here. But as we know, you're going to get to reload. He draws four cards. He doesn't have any mana available, though, so it is very much Canister's world at this point. Can he just kill him? No. Put it under three here. Bronson can take out Wilder's Reclamation he okay. wants to try and prevent any shenanigans here. But at the same time, Brunchon represents lethal damage. It does. It is a lethal attacker. 
And if he sacrifices Brontodon in order to kill the Wilderness Reclamation, he's only got two damage in play. So this is this this game has become quite interesting, I think. Here's Omen of the Sea. Scorching Dragonfire out as well. Ooh, there's an Uro. He needs that life gain. He really could use that life gain. He can actually just play Uro and then escape Uro. That's a, a, a big uh, boost of both life and board presence. Okay, he drew the Uro, but with only four mana available, well, he can he survive he can, he on can, six? He can play it. He'll go to six, mm -hmm. and then he gets the untap from the Wilderness Reclamation. He has the Scorching Dragonfire and Expansion Explosion. Ooh, this is so getting this, the, very the Uro, the Uro is a really, really big deal here because the fact that it brings him to six means he's out of range on board, so he has at least a little bit of breathing room. And you know, well, he, he gets the untap here. He has expansion explosion. He he could obviously if he if uh, canister now recognizes he doesn't have lethal, he can use Brontodon before the end step to kill Wilderness Reclamation mm -hmm. to prevent that untap. So Kavarte can't use the huge Boy. hand of cards he has. And now because a, a canister now knows, okay, this is not the game I thought it was a turn ago. Right. But I it's need to do something so different. close. Like I, right. you know, because he can get him down to one. He has two Cauldron Familiars. He will have a food on the battlefield from the goose if he wants. One of those but it's not quite well, but there. But he, he doesn't necessarily get him down to one because there's the untap and then all that mana gets. Of gets course. Spent, so the right? scorching dragon so fire. If there's another, if there's another expansion explosion, and we know there's two. That can fire off at the Brontodon. Even if you you sacrifice the Brontodon, oh. you still get the cards. Because expansion, uh, ex rather, explosion has two targets. So close this game. It was really looking good for Canister. But Kvartek is not done yet. And look at this. Canister yep. says, that is not my game plan anymore. I have to get rid of your will in his reclamation. I really do think there's a heads up play of doing this before the trigger occurs on the end step because you know the, the, the chance that you actually are able oh. to like, close out the game well, just with this like incremental damage. Another cauldron familiar off the top of the library. Yep. <laughs> it would have been enough. Theoretically. If nothing died, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, as, okay. as we know it would. Well, I, I, a canister, yeah, canisters, you know, thinking, okay, well, if, if he had nothing, yes. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, he has a Murderous Rider, too. You know, that does give him uh, some, uh, some stuff in play, but does prevent him from making a food with the, uh, the goose. And the food is pretty important as well, because, you know, if those, if those familiars do die, you can get to bring them back, and obviously, you know, just digging deeper with Trail of Crumbs. So this is a very tough spot for Canister, for sure. Wow. And also, the, the Uro is still just looming in the graveyard, ready to escape. Yeah, now I'm curious, because let, let's shift our focus back up to Kavartek's side. He no longer has Wilderness Reclamation, so right. this hand is not as explosive as it once Correct. was. Now, Murderous Rider is just going to hit the battlefield. Canister is going to go into big brain mode and pass the turn back to Kavartek, who has to sort of sort his way through a fairly big board, and he's at four life. Does it start with Uro? I Feels like a good place to yeah. start. Get the card, get the three life, get the body on there. Mm -hmm. And there we go. Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. Seen extensive play in standard, and we see it here. I will say it's always fun to me when it's basically explore and there's the huge, like, <laughs> like comes out of the board. It's like, dude, come on, chill out. Yeah, it was, just, it was a three out. life okay. that got us to the huge board. <laughs> well, it's true. The three life is what got us here. <laughs> it is true. For Kavartek, he's very grateful about that three life. Thank you very much. All right, and Kavartek looks like he's passed the turn here. He has uh, Thassa's Intervention, Scorching Dragonfire, and Growth Spiral. Oh, Castle Lockthwain, the draw for Canister. That is very powerful in this sort of situation. He needs more resources to try and fight through. With the Wilderness Reclamation gone, he has more time, mm -hmm. right? There's no threat of just getting blown up by a huge expansion explosion. Yeah, this is interesting, especially given that Canister had to change gears dramatically. He was really looking to finish off the game, ended up saying, okay, my board state's not what it once was. I have to kill your Wilderness Reclamation. And now all of a sudden, he's trying to piece together kind of his main game plan, which is more of a, a mid-range grind fest. 
He's going to trail of crumbs into a mountain here, get back a cauldron familiar, knock Kavartek down to five. And Castle Lockthwain, as you mentioned, can absolutely be a way for him to reload his hand and perhaps find a way to, uh, to pull ahead. <laughs> Canister carefully considering all three of his options here, Mountain, Castle Lockthwain, or Cauldron Familiar. Looks like he's evaluating the mana that uh, Chris is available, figuring out, okay, well, what can you do in response here? The end of my turn. Now, this means that he's not going to get to play Castle Lockthwain or activate it this turn, so he's just going to have to settle for a cat, mountain, and pass the turn back. But there's probably nothing happier here for Kavartek. I'm curious to see if he uses uh, Thassa's Intervention here or maybe the Scorching Dragonfire. He could even play Scorching Dragonfire and expansion it. Mm -hmm. if, because, you know... How that's interesting. Does he does he want to take out multiple things here? Because the, the goose is pretty scary. The the rider is is you know at least the biggest like immediate threat. Mm -hmm. Getting rid of the cauldron familiar is, is only really relevant if you can get rid of all of them. Hey, he kind of got two scorching dragon fires out of the deal. He ended up playing growth spiral plus scorching dragon fire and found another dragon fire off of the growth spiral. Yeah, and the the uro attack trigger it is so much better here for uro to be uh, to be getting in there because you get. An extra card, you get the life. He's much better at going on the offense than he is at blocking. And we see an Ether Gust. So lots oh, of interaction okay. now for Kavartek. Ether Gust is a is a is a really big deal. You can, you can hit the uh, the Trail of Crumbs, mm -hmm. which can you know try to uh, prevent uh, Canister from actually getting you know some continued value. It does just sort of disrupt him. It does if you actually hit Trail of Crumbs, give him more food. So maybe it's actually not even what you want to hit. Yeah, it's interesting, too. The Scorching Dragonfire, I wonder how big of a target the Gilded Goose is at this right. point, right? It, it's really providing the only way for these Cauldron Familiars to keep coming back, for the trails to keep going. And I wonder, yeah, it, before, I think that before the, uh, the decision to, I guess there's no sacrifice, but, but before this, I think uh, Canister, rather, Kavartek is, is thinking of, okay, do I want to... Uh, hit the Trail of Crumbs now, before you decide whether you want to top or bottom it, mm -hmm. you have the information of, okay, I'm going to kill your Gilded Goose. Right. Yeah, that's, so, it's a to it, it would probably change his mind, yep. right? Like, and yeah, that's exactly what's happening. He's going yes. to Aether Gust here. He's like, okay, well, I have a food source. I have the Gilded Goose. This is a pretty powerful card, so do I want to put it on the top? I and think so. And now, top. and now Kavartek can kill the Gilded Goose. It's like, okay, well, you don't have that food source you thought you had repeatedly, and now Trail of Crumbs is much less powerful, and you might not have put it on top if you do it, but he let him draw it. Hmm, he let him draw it. Interesting. Before killing the Goose. Okay. Maybe he's, he's thinking of countering it with intervention? That does seem to be the case here. Remember, the trail would give him yeah. a food anyway, so he says, let's okay. just shut this thing off altogether. Now, four mana available, potentially five, if you count the Goose here for Canister. So Kavartek is going to have to probably just tap a total of five mana on his side. It all. And that would leave him mana with the, for the Scorching Dragon three. Fire. It's double, so. Oh, yeah. it's double, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So this means that, that uh, Canister cannot pay enough, and he still gets to keep Scorching Dragon Fire at the ready. And there's that Castle Lockthwain. And unfortunately for Canister, he just finds a forest with it. Gets to uh, chip in there for a couple of damage with the familiars. One of them is going to get Scorching Dragon fired out of here, but there's still one left and one in the graveyard. Down to six goes Kavartek. Steam vents off the top. Now things are starting to get interesting because Uro is going to buoy him back up to nine life. I mean, we were just talking about, you know, this, this deck, unlike, you know, Teamer Reclamation decks in the past can just be an Uro deck. Yes. Right? You're just a mid range teamer, kind of control ish deck. And Uro alone has absolutely dug Kavartek back into a game where he was effectively at one life. He was dead. He was dead. In a turn. And now he's the one who's attacking with a 6 6, gaining life, and has an incredibly powerful hand. This to me is going to be the turn of the match because this is where Kavartek gets to unleash the full power here of an expansion explosion. Uh, 
you know, give if he has the window that he feels necessary to do so because he has so much mana, even though he doesn't have Nyssa, he doesn't have Wilderness Reclamation, he's just put a bunch of lands into play off of Uro and just the fact that this game's gone for a while. And now he can reload his hand. Oh, another land off the top. All right, this is a big one for a Canister. He can activate Castle Lockwing to draw a card. Let's see if he finds a threat of some sort. Maybe a Corvold or so. Oh, another land. Wow. Yeah, I mean, this is starting to become the tournament for him. He is trying a lot of lands this tournament. Well, I mean, Kvartek has him covered with the fastest innovation in hand. Any individual threat's not enough. And now going to the end step, that's explosion to the face. It's for six, I think. That is going to be very tough to recover from if you're sitting in Pyotr Glagovsky's seat. If Kvartek can find any other way to make sure his life total stays high, he is going to be in business. And, and by the, base, the way... Get that goose out of here. Get that goose out of here while we're at it. And I like this. You know, the, the damage to the face is not what matters. It matters is just absolutely grinding Canister out of any meaningful resources. Oh, and that last card was a Hydroid Crisis, because I was going to say, look, he found a lot more ways to keep himself alive. A pair of Scorching Dragon Fires. Oh, and I should say he has Wilderness Reclamation yeah. plus Expansion Explosion, so that was really everything that Kavartek needed. Down to a virtual one life, and he has fought his way all the way back with Uro Titan of Nature's Wrath really guiding the light here as he, he needed the life gain. I mean, that was it. He needed those three lives over and over and over again, and now Kavartek is in a position to just win this game. Wow. Great comeback from him. Yeah, uh, you know, we saw just how uh, Canister was able to win, even from a five-card hand in the first game, mm -hmm. when things came together for him. But crucially, this game, you know, he had the, uh, the the familiars, he had the goose. He never had the oven. He never had the ability no. to really make use of those cauldron familiars. And it was Kvartek who was able to get all the pieces of his powerful combos together. And when those come together in this deck, they are very powerful. As we see all this mana go into the pool yeah, this for that explosion going to the face. It's going to be lethal. It is. Yeah. This is just going to be it. Chris Kvartek. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> and Kvartek's going to say, actually, you go. Yep. <laughs> because I am going to do, what, 15, 19... He's got 21 mana, <laughs> so 17 you. Wow, I'm impressed. That that was a really Boom. nice comeback from Kavartek, and there it is, explosion Sacrifice. for 17, <laughs> which is just enough even after the food to get the job done. And yeah. Chris Kavartek wins game number three and takes down the match to stay alive. Now. I will remind you one more time, Pyotr Gogovsky, he's not out of the tournament with he's that not. loss, but he is one very short step away, so no wiggle room for Gogovsky. He has set himself up for the ultimate run if he's gonna be the champion. He is gonna have to play a lot of flawless magic and probably run pretty hot for the rest of the and, day and, as well. And worth noting, this was his first loss with Jun Sacrifice in two tournaments. Yes. Two tournaments? Yeah, two high-level <laughs> tournaments as well. Welcome back, Marshall Cycliff with Brian Kibler. Thanks so much for coming along for coverage here at the World Championship 26. We're in Hawaii. Things are beautiful outside. In, the, in here, though, it's battle time. The players, I'm sure you can see it on their faces as well. They are intense, they are focused, and that's because over the course of today, we're going to whittle down this field to just four players, and uh, that means a lot of people going home. Yeah, we already have four players through to the top eight, and uh, the kind of middle eight right now are battling to join them in that top eight later today. That's right, and so that's what we're going to be bringing you over the course of the day. It's all standard, all day today, uh, and of course, we expect to see a lot of exciting things along the lines of what we just saw here. For now, though, we've got an interview with Chris Kavartek and Becca. Wow, thanks, Marshall. I'm here with Chris Kavartek. Chris, tell me about that match three. We were all holding our breath for you. It got very close. It did. Fortunately, it ended up not drawing too well at the end. I really didn't like my play, particularly during that match, especially in the second game where I messed up the Scorching Dragonfire and the Cauldron Familiar. But, I mean, that's the cost of switching to decks at the last minute, especially Team Iraq. It's really difficult to play, and, and Piotr's very, very good. So he did not make it easy for me to win, even though I think the matchup is good for me. Yeah, it seems to be a good matchup. Now, you are typically known for playing pretty mid-rangey, and of course you had Uro on the board there with a the big green creature, but why did you choose to bring something and, as you just said, switch the last minute like that? So I was playing blue-white for pretty much the first seven days leading up to the event, and I just wanted to be more proactive and put my opponent to the test, and I felt like I was missing a lot of land drops of blue-white. It just really wasn't doing it for me. So I went to Team here. My friend was beating me a lot with it. He was a lot better with the deck than me, so... 
hopefully pans out good today. <laughs> yeah, now you didn't bring any Storm's Wrath in your main deck or your sideboard, I believe, which would be really good against the Mono Red because you didn't expect it, is that right? Yeah, I didn't expect it, but I thought like one or two people would bring it. Um, I should have brought like Fiery Cannonades or something. Uh, it was a bonehead move. It was like a calculated risk, but it was a really bad gamble. Like. My cyborg could I could at least put him in the board. I don't know. <laughs> Tell us about why you brought Nissa, which is a difference from other people's team of reclamation lists. So I figured a lot of people would bring blue white because it was what I was thinking. And uh, they have usually three or four Narset and four Teferi, and both those planeswalkers, they have to die, otherwise it's really hard for you to win. Plus, while Storm's Wrath is way better against Monored, Nissa was also my main way to win with Uro. So I felt like it was still maintain the game plan of the deck. Yeah. All right, let's talk about how this year has been huge for you. You've really burst onto the scene. You had two top finishes in uh, Mythic Championships earlier in the year, year and you also qualified uh, for two different events through the Mythic Online Qualifier on Arena. How did you get to this position? What did you have to do? I practiced a lot. I, I don't know, it's kind of cliche. Uh, my, my friends helped me a lot. My testing partner, Robert Lee, he would help me through thick and thin. and yell at me to not play bad decks. So I think he helped me a lot. So shout out to him. Excellent. Well, congratulations. You've got an uphill battle, but I think your chances are looking pretty good with your one uh, win for today. Congratulations on that. Thank you, Becca. Always a pleasure talking to you. Oh, thanks, Chris. All right, let's head back to Marshall and the booth. He's such a nice guy. <laughs> He's really like, it's really nice to talk to you. Welcome back here to coverage of Magic Gathering World Championship 26, powered by Alienware. That's Brian Kilbert and Marshall Sutcliffe. For now, we're going to take a short break, but rest assured, we have a lot more awesome magic action to bring you over the course of the day. But for now, again, a short break. Don't go anywhere. Autumn is quite well known for playing this mono blue deck. Autumn proving that this is just a deck to be reckoned with. And England has a Mythic Championship winner and it's Autumn Burchett. If I like all those efforts I was putting in had really paid off, I've still not come down to earth quite yet. I've had so many people reach out to me and say like, you know, a trans person succeeding is really important to them personally. And just all of that's been so huge, getting all that feedback from people that shows it matters to them. The competition at Worlds, the field is just gonna be brutal. The very best of the best kind of fills me with like a lot of like fire to preparing as hard as I can. To be the next world champion would be life-changing. It would be incredibly validating. I really want to do my very best at this one, more than like any tournament this year. My name is Autumn and I will be the next world champion. Burley's going to think about it and scoop up his permanence. We have our champion, Eli Loveman of the United States, is your Mythic Championship winner here from London. Compared to some of the other players in the field, I'm a little on the newer side. I remember watching some of the people in this tournament playing in Worlds 2012, so it's kind of come full circle, I guess. <laughs> Now I'm here, so I'm gonna try to make the most of it. I'm definitely an underdog going in, so that's probably my main goal. Even if I don't do well, it's at least proof that I can hang. But the thing that I like the most about Magic is playing against really good players, and this is just gonna be the ultimate version of that. It's gonna be a dream come true. The nerves are building up for this event. I usually just like to listen to some music, some loud with death metal, you know, just try to drown out whatever nervous feelings you're feeling. Whatever happens, happens, but I'm definitely gonna try my best. My name is Eli, and I will be the next world champion.
And welcome back to coverage here at Magic Gathering World Championship 26, powered by Alienware, Marshall Cyclist with Brian Kibler, and we are right into live game three action. Autumn Burchett against Toralf Zeverin. And uh, we've got on the top uh, part of your screen there, there's Autumn. Autumn is on Team of Reclamation. And on the bottom, blue, white, control for Toffel. And we've seen uh, a couple different versions of both these decks. Very different version than the one we just saw Chris Kvartek playing, uh, being piloted by Autumn on the top of the screen. Uh, and this is game three, so we are well into sideboarded games. And uh, that's why we see a The Wanderer in Toralf Severin's head. That is, a, that is a card that I was not really expecting to see in this tournament, but it has a passive effect. Uh, of prevent all non-combat damage to be dealt to you and other permanents you control. Uh, so you, it, while that's in play, you can't be explosioned out. That's right. You cannot can't happen. lose to explosion. And there's actually a trio of Planeswalkers now in the deck here for Toffle that are just such a pain for Autumn to have to deal with. One of them's on the battlefield, Narset. So imagine if you have Wanderer and Narset. <laughs> and you try to go exp explosion. Nothing, Nothing happens. happens. It's just Nothing zero. Nothing happens at all. Right. And then, of <laughs> course, the most powerful of the trio is Teferi Time Raveler, which basically just shuts off uh, Wilderness Reclamation as a card. It basically says this doesn't do anything right. anymore. So it really throws a lot of curveballs. And Autumn has to try to navigate through these, find ways to get them off the battlefield, and find that one window when they can go off. But a, a big part of that is what we see in play right now, the Brazen Borrower. Brazen Borrower uh, can not only be used uh, for the Petty Theft ability to actually bounce one of the Planeswalkers, but simply attacking them down is really important. We heard Chris Gavartek uh, discussing how that's part of the reason he ended up with Nissa in his deck, uh, though the Brazen Borrower is sort of the more traditional pl plan to answer them. And of course, a critical decision there from Toffle. You play Narset Parter Avails, you're facing down a Brazen Borrower, do you minus? Toffle decided, yes, yes I will, and got a Dovin's Veto off of it. So perhaps worth it in this case, though it does mean that Narset likely not long for this world. Aethergust heading to the Wilderness Reclamation. There is either Negate or Thassa's Intervention to protect it. Mm. Dovin's Veto can stop one of them. The other one, if, uh, if uh, Autumn does decide to fight will prevent it from resolving, but is it worth committing that much? Taralf also playing clean here. He waited until Autumn's upkeep to fire off this Aether Gust. It might even be past the draw step. Sometimes you'll see that as well. Okay, we've got a stack. Probably going to want to go ahead and counter the negate <laughs> I, here. I, I, I'm trying to think, what, what, what is the, the, the yeah. decision? <laughs> you, you counter your opponent's spell, right. usually not, not your own. Your Though Tor Torolf did win a game by you know, absorbing his emergency Countered powers his yesterday. Spell. So maybe he's like, okay, last time I countered my own spell, it was really good. Oh, Should man. I do it this time? He'll never be the same. <laughs> Boy, wait till the next time he, he finds a remand. Ooh, he's going oh to be in heaven. Oh, dear. <laughs> All right, so Dovin's Veto cannot be countered. It's like negate, but extra. And it's going to, in fact, counter a negate here. So does the Aether Gust resolve? It goes back on top of library. And that was actually upkeep, not draw step. So it Ooh, does yeah. go right back into hand there for Autumn. That actually... You know, thinking about it, that that could actually be a really big problem for uh, Torolf here. Kind of seems relevant. Now, yeah, now now that actually just hits play immediately, gets the full untap on all the lands. We're going to see Dream Trawler, but here's Thassa's intervention. Yeah, right. you know, perhaps it would have been better to allow Autumn to have an unknown draw step and save that Wilderness Reclamation on top of the library for the next turn. We'll find out, though. And Thassa will intervene, it would appear, for enough. Yeah, kind of a tricky position here. Uh, Toffel wanting to keep that planes in hand to have fodder to discard to Dream Trawler. As you can see, he would have actually had enough to pay, but also Autumn could have just paid more. Well, that she just digging, didn't didn't actually. Uh, oh, okay. She just went for the, or excuse me, uh, Autumn just went for the cards and found Mystical Dispute. That gets the job done as well. 
Ooh, that was actually nice. Yeah. <laughs> and now we have Expansion Explosion with that Wilderness Acclamation, which landed on the board. So I, I, what was the game plan, though, if Autumn didn't find another counter? Because the Fry can kind of set back the Dream Trawler for a turn. It was kind of some risky biz there for Autumn. It was. Uh, I mean, certainly, I mean, perhaps taking a look at the, the list, there's uh, Mystical Dispute, Negate, other interventions. I, I wasn't actually looking exactly how much mana was still up after the intervention. Possible you could have fired off a second one if you hit that. Boy, but, but looking back, or looking forward now, Autumn Burchett, they are in great position. Oh, yeah. Having just landed a nice big Hydroid Crisis, a 5-5 with the Brazen Borrower. Ooh, hello. Elspeth Conqueror's Death. Oh, awkward. This is the first time I've seen this interaction. Elspeth Conqueror's Death cannot get <laughs> rid of that. The, there is the Wanderer. There is the Wanderer. Okay. And Power crucially, forward, not just preventing the explosion from hitting you, but can exile uh, creatures with power for a greater. And now, that crisis, yeah, right in that wheelhouse. That's right. Now a question for, for Autumn. Do they want to use Negate here on the Wanderer? With Fry in hand, they have the answer, but it would be a minus two later, and that could be big. No, Autumn says, you know what? Go ahead. You can have the Wanderer. Likely just going to take out the Hydroid Crisis. Yeah, I, I don't feel like Autumn is really that worried about protecting this Hydroid yeah. Crisis. The important things in this game at this point are Wilderness Reclamation and Expansion Explosion. If Autumn is able to protect those, then you know, look, at this point, Torolf just tapped out. And now Autumn is in a position with Reclamation plus Explosion. Yes, you can't uh, take damage. Uh, from the the explosion, but, but you brazen borrower brazen borrower takes it out. Yep, yeah. and so then, that's probably game. I mean, this the is going to be an expansion four. for what? There's five, six, seven, eight. So that's sixteen mana. Well, twelve. So, so it's one, one off short. lethal. Yeah. But of course, the the second chapter to explosion is always. And by the way, right, <laughs> I have infinite cards. Yeah, that's and the big thing. This is huge. We see for Torf Autumn hovering over the concede button, waiting for the, exp the explosion but Toffle, to land. But you're not dead. All right, it looks like that was plenty <laughs> enough to get the job done, and Autumn Burchett wins the match two games to one, and they move forward into a, a safer zone, let's yep. say, than where Toffle's going to find himself as he sits down for his next round. This, of course, is all.